You've heard of the universe, but have you heard of the multiverse? Proponents of the multiverse claim that there's a vast, possibly infinite array of other universes, universes different from our own. The multiverse typically comes up in discussions between theists and atheists, discussions about what's called the fine-tuning of the cosmos. Theists point out that the universe is finely tuned for intelligent life. They say that the odds of getting a universe like ours are so staggeringly small, we can't be here by chance. Atheists respond by claiming that if there's actually an infinite array of universes, well, it's not so improbable that at least one of them would be capable of supporting intelligent life. In fact, many of them might be capable of supporting intelligent life. With infinity on your side, so much is possible. But wait a moment. Theists have infinity on our side. So if atheists think it's reasonable to appeal to an infinite array of universes to explain the features of our universe, obviously they shouldn't have any objection if theists do the exact same thing. What do I mean here? I mean that theists can offer a multiverse response to what's called the problem of evil, or the argument from evil, and that atheists, if they're consistent, can't really object to our multiverse response. Let's see how this works. First, we'll make sure everyone understands the fine-tuning argument. Then we'll cover the multiverse response to the fine-tuning argument. Then we'll make sure everyone understands the problem of evil. And finally, we'll present the multiverse response to the problem of evil. So, fine-tuning. To get the idea here, think about a fish tank. I was about seven years old, and my friend Todd got a fish tank with a bunch of fish for Christmas. We were using the fish tank thermometer as a torpedo to try to hit the fish, and Todd broke the thermometer. All his fish died in the next few days. Why? Because the tank had to be kept at a specific temperature for the fish to survive. The temperature had to be finely tuned, but not nearly as finely tuned as the universe. The fundamental structure of the universe has to be finely tuned for intelligent life. The forces and constants of physics, certain physical quantities, the ratios between the masses of atomic particles, and the properties of elements and compounds have to be just right, or we wouldn't be here. Consider some of the forces of nature. Without gravity, there'd be no planets, stars, or galaxies, and I wouldn't even be able to sit in this chair. Without the strong nuclear force, protons and neutrons wouldn't hold together in the nucleus of an atom, and hydrogen would be the only element on the periodic table. Without the electromagnetic force, there'd be no chemical interactions between atoms, and the molecules necessary for life couldn't form. But the fact that we have the necessary forces isn't nearly as surprising as the fine-tuning of the numbers that physicists plug into the laws of nature. These are the constants of physics. The cosmological constant, the gravitational constant, the strong force constant, the fine structure constant. These numbers could have had a wide range of values, and yet the values they actually have fall into the extremely narrow range that make biological life possible. Part of the reason we're alive is that the universe turned out just right for life. Should we attribute this to chance? Did we just get lucky? Well, suppose a murderous psychopath locks you in a room, puts a gun to your head, and hands you two dice. He says, if you roll double sixes, I'll let you live. If you roll anything else, you're dead. Now, roll. So, you roll the dice. Huh. Double sixes. Man, that was lucky. Then he tells you to do it again. Double sixes again, or you're dead. You roll them again. Huh. Double sixes. That was really lucky. But what if it keeps happening? He makes you roll again and again and again, and day after day, year after year, you keep rolling the numbers necessary for life, your life. Does there ever come a point where you say, come on, the dice are loaded? If the answer is yes, if there are limits to what can reasonably be described as luck, then we have to believe that someone had us in mind when the universe was created, because the odds of getting a life-permitting universe by chance are a lot worse than rolling double sixes a bunch of times. 
As the late astrophysicist Sir Fred Hoyle said, a common sense interpretation of the facts suggests that a super intellect has monkeyed with physics as well as chemistry and biology, and that there are no blind forces worth speaking about in nature. But atheists have a response. It's the multiverse response. If there are a lot of universes, then maybe the odds of getting a life-permitting universe aren't so bad. Think about it. If you're only dealt five cards in a hand of poker, and it's the only poker hand you're ever dealt, it would be extremely improbable for you to get a royal flush. But if you're dealt a million hands, and one of them is a royal flush, well, that's not improbable at all, because the odds of getting a royal flush when dealt just five cards are about one in 650,000. So, while a life-permitting universe may seem extremely improbable given the odds of the laws of nature being just right for life, what happens if there are an infinite number of universes? If there are an infinite number of universes, each with its own variations in the laws of nature, Suddenly, it's not as surprising that we hit the jackpot in ours. Problem solved, right? Not quite. There are all kinds of objections to the multiverse response, but I'm going to ignore all of them. Let's just grant that it's perfectly acceptable to appeal to an infinite array of unobserved, undetectable universes to explain certain features of our universe. The point I want to make in this video is that if our atheist friends get to appeal to the multiverse to respond to an argument, it's only fair that we also get to appeal to the multiverse to respond to an argument, right? That's fair, isn't it, atheists? You don't want to be hypocrites, do you? Thank you for your anticipated consistency. All right, now, the main argument against the existence of God is called the problem of evil, or the argument from evil. Here, evil doesn't just include what we normally think of as evil, namely moral evil. It also includes all kinds of human and animal suffering, what we call natural evil. There are many versions of the argument from evil. The idea, generally, is that if an all-powerful, all-knowing, perfectly good being exists, there shouldn't be so much suffering in our world. God could do a better job. Theists often respond to the argument from evil by offering philosophical or theological reasons for God to allow, or sometimes to produce, the bad things we see around us. Philosophical reasons for God to allow suffering are called theodicies. Examples of popular theodicies are free will theodicies, God allows us to do evil things because free will is important, and soul-building theodicies, Suffering actually causes us to grow morally and spiritually and to develop virtues like courage and compassion. There are dozens of theodicies that are meant to explain various kinds of evil and suffering. Then there are theological explanations, which would be things like, human beings have rebelled against God, and at least some of the bad things that happen in this world are the result of that rebellion. Atheists answer these philosophical and theological reasons for suffering by saying, in effect, are these things really so important to God that he has to allow this mess we see around us? Is free will so important to God that he has to allow human trafficking? Is soul building so important to God that we need hurricanes? Is punishing us for rebellion so important to God that animals need to get caught in the crossfire? And then theists would argue that these things really are that important. But I'm not going to go in that direction. I'm just going to do what atheists do. I'm going to offer the multiverse response to the problem of evil. I'm simply going to say, what if God created a multiverse? What if God created an infinite array of universes? God certainly has the power to do that. Suppose God created each universe with different features. Perhaps the vast majority of alternative universes are the hedonistic paradises that atheists say God should have made. But in our universe, God did things a little differently. He gave people a great deal of free will. He made a place where lots of things go wrong so that people can develop virtues like courage and compassion. He punished rebellion. 
Can you really say that God couldn't do this in just one of the infinite universes he created? On what basis can you say that he couldn't? Your feelings? Why should your feelings about the multiverse response to the problem of evil bother us any more than our feelings about the multiverse response to cosmic fine-tuning bother you? Or are you going to say that there's something really, really weird about appealing to an infinite array of unobservable, undetectable alternative universes to explain away the features of the one we actually observe? Too late to say that now. The problem of evil has been defeated. All thanks to the multiverse. I don't make the rules, atheists. I just enforce them. By the way, if you'd like a fuller introduction to cosmic fine-tuning, be sure to check out William Lane Craig's excellent animated video on the fine-tuning of the universe.